Venice is an enchanting city that casts visitors under an intoxicating spell. It's dreamy and romantic, with an undercurrent of mystery and drama. And while Carnival is only once a year, its mood is present year-round. The Grand Canal is the center of activity, with gondoliers singing to the passengers in their boats. The magnificent Piazza San Marco is another must-see hub. Along the winding streets you'll find stylish cafes and gelaterias, souvenir shops and small businesses, plus Renaissance palaces and Gothic churches. After you've climbed the Campanile and visited the Gallery dell'Academia, stroll through the surrounding neighborhoods, where locals eat citrity and drink their vino in unfussy bars and restaurants. Since the fall of the Venetian Republic in 1797, the city has held an unrivaled place in the Western imagination and has been endlessly described in prose and verse. The luminous spectacle of ornate marbled and frescoed palaces, bell towers, and domes reflected in the sparkling waters of the lagoon under a blue Adriatic sky has been painted, photographed, and filmed to such an extent that it is difficult to distinguish the real city from its romantic representations. The visitor arriving in Venice is still transported into another world, one whose atmosphere and beauty remain incomparable. Today Venice is recognized as part of the artistic and architectural patrimony of all humanity, a fitting role for a city whose thousand-year economic and political independence was sustained by its role in global trading. The situation of the city on islands has limited modern suburban spread beyond the historic center, its framework of canals and narrow streets has prevented the intrusion of automobiles, and its unmatched wealth of fine buildings and monuments dating from the period of commercial dominance has ensured a keen and almost universal desire for sensitive conservation. This concern for conservation is now extended not just to the city's monuments but to the very city itself, as rising water levels and subsidence of the land upon which Venice is built threaten the continued existence of the city in its present form. In 1987 Venice and its lagoon were collectively designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site originally formed by the interaction of Adriatic tidal currents and the waters of several alpine rivers, Pio, Sile. Bacchiglian, and Brenta, the lagoon has always been crucial to the survival of Venice. Its mud banks, shallows, and channels are a source of income from marine and bird life and from salt pans. The lagoon has served as protection. The Venetians defeated the Genoese in 1380 through their superior knowledge of the navigable channels, and as a natural sewerage system, with the tides flushing out the city's canals twice daily. Most visitors experience Venice in summer, when average daytime temperatures are in the mid-70s to low 80s f, about 24 to 27 c, with a haze caused by high humidity frequently obscuring the view of the Alps across the lagoon. Spring and autumn bring clear, bright light, especially when winds are northerly, giving relief from the exhausting heat of the southerly, Sirocco. In January the mean average temperature is mid-30 sf, 2.2 c, and wintertime Venice is dulled and chilled by mists, lending the city an especially mysterious appearance. Annual rainfall averages about 34 inches, 865 millimeters, of which more than 7 inches, 185 millimeters, falls in October and November and about 6.5 inches, 170 millimeters, in May and June. Settlement in the lagoon predates Roman times, but the present urban structure took shape in the early 7th century, when migrants from the mainland swelled existing fishing communities on the higher mudflats and sandbanks. Among these early settlements, Rivo Alto, its name corrupted over time to Rialto, was the most central and became the heart of Venice, linking together 118 separate islands with bridges and canals and subordinating all other settlements to the rule of its elected doge, Du. In all these liberal settlements the characteristic plan, still detectable in the street patterns, was dominated by a navigable channel from which side channels branched at intervals. More than 200 original canals have been linked together to form a dense urban network on either side of the curving Grand Canal, which describes a great backward S, more than two miles long, from the railway station to San Marco Basin in front of the Doge's Palace. 
Its width varies from about 100 to 225 feet, 30 to 70 meters, and it is lined by buildings that once were the palaces of great merchant families and the public warehouses, or fondasy, used in foreign trade. The original pattern of separate islands surrounding the Rialto is evident in the parishes of Venice. In many respects they remain distinct communities, with life centered on the square, or campo, side of the community well, and its parish church. Perhaps the most clearly recognizable such area today is the ghetto, the islet on which from 1516 to 1797 Venice's Jews were confined. Indeed, the very word ghetto was first used with reference to Venice. The ghetto is located in the northwestern part of the city and is surrounded by canals whose bridges were once raised and guarded at night. Because this was the only area in which Jews could live in Venice, houses are densely packed and rise to seven stories, alleyways are almost too narrow for two people to pass. Many parishes had their own minor guild or fraternity, and at festivals their representatives competed with one another to provide floats or oarsmen, a ritualized rivalry encouraged by the ruling patricians to promote civic stability. Over time the patchwork of local streets, canals, and keys has been modified to improve the overall structure of the city. Keyside paths have been widened to form canal side walkways, or fondamenti. Canals have been filled in, Rio Terra, and streets have been joined by passages under the houses. For the visitor, trying to find an address in Venice is not made any easier by the practice of numbering houses consecutively through a whole district rather than along each street. The best known form of transport on the waterways of Venice is the gondola. Today there are only several hundred of these unique, keyless boats left, and they have long been outnumbered by other vessels. But their elegant, sleek shape and gleaming black paintwork have made them a symbol of Venice. Many writers have described the romance of Venice by gondola, and many tourists are still willing to pay high prices to be rowed at twilight through the canals to the singing of a gondolier. But it is many years since gondoliers could recite verses from such Italian poets as Ariosto or Tasso while maneuvering their amazingly flexible craft around the sharp bends of the minor canals. A number of gondolas still serve as ferries across the Grand Canal, but the cost of maintenance makes their ultimate disappearance likely. The houses, case, or, in Venetian, plie, that line the streets and canals of the city range from the poorest blocks to the great palaces, palazzi, ordinary houses, generally rise three or four stories. They originally had external staircases and were grouped around a communal courtyard and well. Their simple rectangular doorways and window lights may be framed in unpolished marble, otherwise they are unornamented. Their red brick or oak painted stucco walls giving a comfortable warmth to the townscape. But it is the palaces, not the ordinary dwellings, that front directly onto the larger canals, particularly the Grand Canal, with gaudily painted mooring posts marking their water entrances. The landscape of Venice is as much a product of its economic activities, past and present, as of its physical environment. The enduring foundation of Venetian wealth was maritime commerce, initially in local products such as fish and salt from the lagoon, but, rapidly expanding to include rich stores of merchandise as Venice became the interpot between Europe and the Middle East and Asia. The Rialto remains the core of Venetian commercial and mercantile activity. Fruit, fish, and other markets are concentrated under the open arcades of the Rialto New Building, 1554, by San Sovino, and associated buildings. The Rialto Bridge and surrounding streets remain crowded with market stalls. Along the Merceria, the route from the Rialto Bridge to the Piazza San Marco, St. Mark's Square, are the offices of the major banks, still in the traditional banking quarter. The main port and related activities have now shifted to the parish of Mendigola in the west. There the main cruise liners dock, and the offices of shipping lines occupy former palaces. But the real focus of commercial shipping today is Port Margara, developed next to the suburb of Mester on the mainland shore west of Venice. Marco Polo International Airport, 1960, was built on reclaimed land at Tessera, to the northwest of the city. Although these areas are incorporated into the administration of Venice, the chief port activities are largely separate from the city proper. Their impact, on the old city, however, has been considerable. 
Magara was for 50 years the site of a huge oil refining and petrochemical complex, easily visible from Venice and a source of air pollution that severely damaged its architecture. Although industrial activity at Margara has declined, the long-term damage of pollution is still felt. Scattered throughout Venice are small boatyards and other traditional luxury craft workshops producing lace, textiles, and furniture. One of Venice's oldest specialties is glassware. The finest products are of exquisite quality, but most of the present-day glass goods are trinkets for the tourist trade. In 1291 many of the glass working furnaces were relocated on the island of Morano to the north as a precaution against fire. Morano remains the focus of present-day glass production, though the industry has declined considerably. Exhaust fumes from this ancient industry also have contributed to the corrosion of Venice's stonework. Since the end of the 18th century, tourism has been at the heart of the Venetian economy. Luxury establishments such as the Daniele Hotel and the celebrated Caf Florian were developed in the 19th century for wealthy foreigners. Small hotels and shops, particularly souvenir and carnival mask shops, line each major street and square along the routes from the station and parking lots to the Rialto and San Marco. Most of the city's workers find employment in tourism and its related industries, now continuous through all seasons. Reacting to their physical environment and to a variety of cultural influences, from Italy, Northern Europe, and the East, the Venetians consciously designed their city as an exceptional place. They regarded it as a divinely ordained center of religious, civic, and commercial life, a community blessed by Saint Mark protected by its lagoon, and governed by a balanced constitution incorporating monarchy, aristocracy, and republican liberty. Historians refer to this perception as the myth of Venice. The architecture of the city, especially in the Renaissance, purposely emulated republican Rome, and the great rituals of state, the doge's procession from his palace to the basilica or the annual marriage with the sea, when the doge cast a gold ring into the lagoon as a sign of true and perpetual dominion publicly expressed the myth. San Marco Basilica was the focus of public religious life, but the scores of other Venetian churches are an essential element of the city's landscape. Their campaniles, rarely perpendicular, punctuate the skyline, their ornate facades grace the squares, from the delicate Gothic of Madonna dell'Otto, c. 1350, rebuilt in the early 15th century, and the restrained elegance of the early Renaissance at Santa Maria de Miracoli, 1481-89, to the Baroque flamboyance of San Mois just as the city's architecture reflects notions of Venice as a place for public ritual, so too Venetian painting evokes the myth of Venice. The magnificent art treasures of the Republic now grace churches, palaces, and galleries throughout the city. Early paintings were heavily influenced by Byzantine traditions, as can be seen in the religious icons of Lorenzo and Paolo Veneziano and in the taste for mosaic patternings and vibrant color and the love of light that are characteristic of the Venetian school. Painting styles evolved in concert with broader European tastes, and in the 18th century much of the work became more frivolous color and splendor reflecting civic pride are evident in Venetian music too. The works written for several separate choirs by Giovanni Gabrieli and Claudio Monteverdi for San Marco Basilica echoed round its Byzantine interior with stirring effect. After the opening in 1637 of the San Cassano Theatre, Europe's first public opera house, the commercial flair of Venice's patricians, allied to the secular ambitions of choir masters of San Marco such as Monteverdi and Francesco Cavalli, both noted opera composers, and Giovanni Legrenzi, made Venice the operatic capital.